Welcome to Veteran Resource Podcast, where you will meet nonprofit organizations focused on improving the lives of veterans and their family members. Here is your host, Jeremy Paris. Welcome, everybody, to episode three of the Veteran Resource Podcast. Today's guest is Maureen Stewart. Maureen is the MC host and workshop producer for the DC Shootoff Video Workshop. Maureen has over 13 years of experience as a videographer and graphic designer. She joined the Air Force in 1999 and served for 10 years. While in the Air Force, she served with the 1st Combat Camera Squadron as an aerial videographer documenting contingency operations around the world. She also has more than six years of experience as an instructor and was certified in and taught three courses at the Defense Information School. While serving, she earned her BFA in digital design. Currently, she is the Chief of Publishing and Design for Airman Magazine, the official magazine of the United States Air Force. She also runs her own freelance graphic design business, Design Stew, where she regularly volunteers her talents to nonprofit agencies in need of design work. And Maureen didn't put this in her bio, but I also happen to know that she sings like an angel. I was fortunate enough to be on the stage performing with Maureen for Telling Baltimore. And during opening night, we had a musician that would play taps during the performance and we would all stand up and we would salute. Well, we didn't have that musician for any of the performances after that first performance. So Maureen went and found a version of taps that had lyrics. And she sang these lyrics during the rest of the performances without any accompanying music. And let me tell you, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I had to fight back my emotions, my feelings, so that I could finish out my performance. Maureen is just one of those amazing souls with such a creative mind, and she truly is one of my favorite people in the world. So let's get into the interview and find out what Maureen has going on with the DC Shootoff Video Workshop. Welcome, Maureen, to the Veteran Resource Podcast. Pretty excited to have you on today. Thanks. It's great to be here. I appreciate you inviting me. Yeah, I was really stoked about this interview because me having a film and acting background, this is right up my alley. Yeah. Also, on top of that, you're just one of my favorite people in the world. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. You're not so bad yourself, Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you. For the listeners out there, Maureen and I spent some time together performing the Telling Project. It was uh, Telling Baltimore last year and we became pretty close friends during that so yeah it was great to it was just such a great experience to to meet all the veterans and you know to leave there with lifelong friendship so what a great experience and i will be talking more about the telling project in a future episode i've already contacted jonathan the director and and he's on board so looking forward to that but before we get into the dc shoot off video workshop Wanted to talk a little bit more about you, Maureen, kind of go back into your childhood and, and find out who you are. Okay, let's do that. So where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Oceanside, California, um, which is, you know, about 60 miles north of San Diego. So I'm a California girl all the way. Nice. And when you were growing up, did you do a lot of surfing out there? <laughs> no, I actually didn't surf. I did um, a little bit of boogie boarding and did a lot of... Uh, sitting in the sand, reading books, and um, nice. sitting by bonfires. So, <laughs> no, not a lot of surfing. That's <laughs> one of my goals. I, I'd love to be at the beach for uh, an extended period of time and just kind of really get into surfing. So, had to ask. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish. I wish. <laughs> Were you really into art growing up, or was this something that developed over time? You know, I was co- always kind of a creative kid, I guess. I always had something going on. I took theater classes and I did theater in high school and um, I did choir. Um, I also did speech and debate. So a lot of verbal, I guess, on on that front. But I was always, you know, I always really liked to draw. And one of my early jobs before I joined the military was actually um, at a at a photography place where I developed film. Um, And so that kind of sparked my interest in photography. So yeah, I, I think I always kind of had a mind for that, a creative sort of mind. I always really enjoyed that kind of outlet for for just, you know, anything. It was just always something that I, I don't know, just really, really loved being able to 
do things uh, in a creative way to express myself. So when you got your first camera, were you tagging around, following all of your friends and getting in their face? Oh, yeah, I definitely was. <laughs> um, when I had that job, at, uh, it was at a Ritz camera, actually. Um, you know, I saved up some money and I, I bought a camera and, oh, yeah, I was doing shoots with all my friends, um, you know, and it was great because I had the ability to go develop my own film and kind of learn that way. And it was a really, really good experience for me. And it was a lot of fun. Pretty cool. And then you went in the military. How old were you when you went in the military? Um, I joined the military when I was 19. Um, I didn't join right out of high school. I actually did about a year of community college before I decided to join the Air Force. And what uh, what changed your mind there? What made you decide to join? You know, I was, like I said, I was young. Um, my parents had moved away and uh, I didn't want to move. Like I said, I was living in California and my folks had moved to Alabama. And there's no way, you know, I was leaving California <laughs> for Alabama. Um, so, <laughs> so I decided to stay and I actually finished out high school after my parents moved. And then I lived with some family friends and at the time I was working anywhere from two to three jobs and going to college full time. And it was just really hard. I could, um, I could barely afford food and, um, let alone paying bills. So there was a point where, you know, I kind of saw myself going nowhere and I knew that I needed some forced, um, structure in my life. I needed, you know, I needed to kick in the ass. So I decided to look in the military so really, it was like a self-preservation sort of thing. I see. And when you went in to talk to the recruiter, did you already have a, a job in mind that you wanted to do or even know that it existed? Uh, yeah, I absolutely did know that photography existed. Um, and that's actually what I wanted. But recruiters are funny. If you go to them telling them exactly what you want, they... Um, they, they can't promise you anything, um, but they'll make it sound like they can. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so I knew the job was available or possible for photography, but I, I had no guarantee that I was going to get it. And so I wound up going open general, which is about the dumbest thing you can do. Um, but the stars aligned for me and, um, I didn't get photography, but I got videography, um, which you know, it was pretty amazing to even get within the career field uh, as a whole, you know, even across all the services, that kind of that career field video photo is very small. Um, so I was really fortunate to to get something that I, you know, that was within the realm of what I wanted. Yeah, when I when I went in, I had no idea that any kind of creative jobs like that existed in the military. Uh, you, well, you know my story from the telling project, but uh, in a nutshell, yeah, I kind of was told, yeah, you need to pick a job. And I grabbed administration because it was first on the list and and I could type. So yeah. <laughs> uh, had I known that there was some kind of a creative job, uh, writing, photography, videography, I'm sure I would have jumped on it back then. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's one of those things nowadays, m more people know. Um, but yeah, it was one of those things that... Um, a lot of people don't realize, and I think a lot of civilians don't realize um, a lot of the jobs that are available in the military. I mean, it's it's its own self sustained community. Um, so just about any job you can think of, you know, is is out there. It's pretty incredible when you really kind of look at all the career fields available. Yeah, it really is. When you started doing videography, was was it what you expected it to be in the military? <sighs> I don't know that I went in with any expectations. Um, really, I knew when I when I chose the job. Um, I believe the name was Visual Information Production Documentation, and Whoa. I didn't. Well, yeah, I didn't quite. I didn't quite understand. I knew that it had something to do somewhere. You know, there's some sort of visual communication in there. Um, and I kind of understood that it was video, but I really didn't get it um, until I got to my tech school. Then I, I realized that, you know, I was going to be shooting video and editing video together and um, basically, you know, making small movies, if, if you want to think of it, you know, uh, simply. Um, and that was, I, I was just like, wow, this is, this is really cool. And early on, I realized how lucky I was. I mean, like I said, I had gone open general 
And when you do that, you know, when you're when you're in the service and you go up in general, um, for us, for the Air Force at the time, anyhow, um, I, I received a list and the list was all the jobs that were available for when I graduated basic training. And next to each job description on the list was the number of vacancies available for each job. And I remember at the top of the list was security forces and there were 77 openings. And right underneath that, wow, yeah, I know. And right underneath that was services, which had something like sixty something openings. And services can encompass, you know, everything from mortuary affairs to um, food service to you know all sorts of things. Um, and then there was the visual information production documentation specialist, uh, and there was two openings. So, <laughs> so and like I said, I remember that pretty vividly because you know I would have been okay. Um, wherever I had gone, you know, a job is what you make of it. And any of those jobs, you know, I've known amazing people that have done, um, all of those jobs. Um, but to get what I wanted when there was only, you know, such a small percentage of jobs available, I already knew, I knew going into it that I was very, very fortunate. And I tried to remember that throughout. Oh yeah. That, that never happens. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But like, I, I think I'll probably tonight, I'll probably say um, that the stars align for me a lot. So um, I may say that once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> and so did your, did your job stay the same all the way through the military? It was the same kind of thing that I did. Just, you know, what you do exactly kind of depends on the duty station. Um, and my first duty station outside of um, when I left tech school, I went to Minot, North Dakota. <laughs> yeah, there I was um, for the for quite quite a long time. For pretty much most of the time I was there, um, I was the only videographer on post. And the post had two wings, so there was a bomb wing and a space wing. Um, and so I covered any sort of um, any sort of emergency where they needed video. I covered, um, or I you know I created morale videos and I created. Um, you know, training videos and investigation videos. You know, I, I edited videos of, you know, uh, suicide aftermaths. Like, oh, wow. you know, when you're on a base level um, shooting, it, it's, again, it's it's whatever, you know, everything, everything. Um, and so that was interesting. Um, and I learned a lot. You know, I learned a lot. Um, it was kind of a trial by fire sort of thing because like I said, I was the only videographer on post there. So in a lot of ways it was good for me because, um, I was put in a position where I had to learn. I had to swim or I was going to sink, but I didn't have a mentor either. That was hard. You know, I had no one to really learn from when it came to my craft. So, so that was pretty tough at my first duty station. You know, I, I wound up volunteering to go from there to the first combat camera squadron which at the time was the only combat camera squadron, active duty combat camera squadron within the air force. And they, they accepted me. That was kind of my ticket out of my not. Um, and the mission there is different. So when you're at a base level, like I said, you kind of do whatever the base needs, but when you go to a combat camera unit, those are the, for the air force is the units that um, will send out photographers and videographers and photojournalists whenever there's, an emergency or a war or a contingency operation or a humanitarian operation combat camera goes out to cover the meaty stuff versus uh base level stuff so you were uh you were doing some deploying at that time as well yeah i did a little bit of deploying um and i did a lot of uh you know travel throughout that time and both stateside and and overseas you know, it was a really great experience for me. Absolutely. You get to go in any place really cool? One of my favorites, a couple of my favorites, I went and I did an exercise, a NATO exercise in Bulgaria. And Bulgaria was beautiful. That was a place that you kind of never think you're going to go. So that was really cool. And uh, it was also, not only was it beautiful there, but uh, work, you know, working a NATO exercise, you can get to work with couple dozen different nations and um you know people from all the services in those nations and that was a really incredible experience deployment wise uh, i really enjoyed my turkey deployment it was just uh i was there for about four and a half or five months 
again, just another really beautiful place. The people are just really great there. And, you know, it's, it's close to the water, which, which I love. Of course and you love. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that was one of those places that I always thought if, uh, if I ever had to live, you know, overseas, that would, that would be one of those places. If I ever had to do a remote, I would love to go back to Turkey. And so uh, when, did you, when did you get out of the military? I got out of the military in 2009. 2009. Okay. And when you got out, you transitioned into uh, a civilian job doing something that you were, something similar to what you were doing in the military? Right. So um, at the time of my separation, I was uh, an instructor at the Defense Information School, and I was teaching the uh, broadcast combat correspondent course. So basically, I was teaching the tech school or the A school for service members that were just entering the service or um, folks that were cross training. And, uh, you know, while I was in, I was able to get my, my associates and then later my bachelor's degree in digital design. So even though I was doing video, I was kind of leaning towards graphics at that point. And so when I knew I was getting out, I, you know, there was, I knew there was a lot of jobs coming up at the schoolhouse where I already worked and, you know, uh, Logically, I thought, hey, this would be a really easy way to transition um, or easier uh, way to transition if I could stay here. It would kind of take the the sting away <laughs> a little bit because transitioning right. is, yeah, transitioning is really hard. Um, so uh, I was, again, very lucky. I, I didn't want to stay in the department that I was working in. I didn't want to teach broadcast. I wanted to have my hands in graphics a little bit. So I, I went to the department that had, um, a multimedia course that I had actually taken and I loved and I really wanted to be a part of. And they, they had a position available and they wanted me. Um, so they held it for me. So that was really amazing. So I was able to roll out of one department at that schoolhouse um, in uniform one day and come back, you know, another day in civilian clothes and teach another course. Um, and like I said, that really eased the pain of the transition for me a lot. So that would be another one of those examples where the stars align for you, huh? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> you know, there's so many courses. I, I could have taught a video course very easily there, but that's not what I wanted. Uh, there was video courses that were available that had positions open, um, far more positions open than what was open for the multi. There was one position open for the multimedia course, and there was, you know, several for video jobs. And, you know, I, I said it just, I started to really love graphics and I got my degree in graphics and I had been through the course and I had scored highly in the course and I was already a, you know, certified instructor. So I had everything that they needed. They wouldn't have had to train me. Um, I wanted it. They could hold it for me. And uh, yeah, it just, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing that I, again, I got what I wanted and I don't want to make it sound like it's luck. You know, a lot of it's hard work too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I say the stars aligned, but you know, I, I get up on a ladder and I, you know, shove those stars around if I can. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's also and, a lot of hard work, but yeah, I was very fortunate. And that led to your, your current job with Airman Magazine. Is that correct? Um, kind of, I, you know, I taught for a couple years doing graphics and video and, and even taught a little bit of photo, you know, camera stuff. Not, I'm not a photographer but just like mechanics and stuff like that. But, you know, I was, I had been teaching for so long and not doing, and I, I really felt that for me to be an effective graphic designer, I needed to take a job where I had deadlines and clients and someone to, to answer to, um, not just for teaching, but for actually, you know, creating product. Um, and so I started applying for jobs and I, you know, it was kind of a, just for the heck of it sort of thing. Um, I saw this job available with the FDA and it was a government position. And uh, at the schoolhouse, I was a contractor. And I was like, well, this would be a good foot in the door for me to, uh, to get a government position. And I didn't think I would get it. You know, it was the first job I'd ever applied for outside of, you know, getting the job where I was. And they, you know, they called me for an interview and um, they liked me and I got the job. So of course. um I left teaching. I left teaching to go work for the FDA for a little while. And what's funny is even though it was a graphic design job, they they really wanted me in that position. Um a lot of it had to do with my video experience. So, oh. so that helped me out a lot. So I worked there for a couple of years, but I found that 
I, I desperately missed the uniform being around, um, people in uniform and being around the air force and, and helping to tell the air force story. Yeah. I, I know the feeling. Yeah, it was, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's different. It's, it's a different world. Um, you know, leaving the military and stepping into an environment where there's not very many veterans and there's not a lot of people that, you know, understand what it is to be a veteran. So, you know, after I, I stayed there for a couple years, and I started, you know, kind of looking at, at other jobs at that point. And um, I, I got a phone call um, saying, hey, this uh, this position is opening. You know, we obviously can't promise it to you, but would you like to apply? And it was the position for airmen. And that's like a dream job for me. And I said, yes, absolutely. I absolutely want to apply. And, uh, you know, I again, I was able to leave that other job when I wanted to leave it and take this job with Airman Magazine, which has been, oh man, I work with such talented people that it's just, it's amazing. And Airman Magazine is the official magazine for the Air Force. It's not in print anymore. It's all on on tablets, all digital. And we're working to get it, you know, to mobile devices like your phone. But the content and the, uh, the way it's presented is so beautiful. And the photographers are amazing. And the multimedia storytellers are incredible. And we have such great writers. Um, and it's such an A-team. So to be able to be part of that, you know, to kind of be invited into that fold, uh, I just, like I said, I'm humbled every single day and I'm really, you know, really fortunate to be there and I love it so much. Yeah. I'm always wowed by the, uh, what comes out in Airman Magazine. The stories are just incredible. Some of them very hard to, uh, to, to not tear up and, and, you know, very emotional, great writing, um, and, and the videos and the, the multimedia just, yeah. Breathtaking work. Yeah. They're, 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 they're amazing. And um, you know, I, I can only hope to, as part of that team to, um, you know, my biggest, my biggest goal is to present their work in a way that makes them proud and, you know, is beautiful and impactful. And yeah, like I said, I just, I really love it there. It's a great place to be. Cool. So let's, uh, let's start talking about the DC shoot off. Sure. That would be neat. <laughs> <laughs> How did the DC shoot off video workshop get its get its start so we're in the fifth year this will be the fifth year for the the video shoot off the sister workshop to that is a photo shoot off and that's been going on for about 10 years Mm. Um, or yeah they just had their 10th year workshop and so you know a few years ago um we really started thinking you know a a couple folks in particular one femath and anna femath these are one, I was stationed with him in a combat camera, super talented uh, storyteller and, and graphic artist. He uh, He's very passionate about storytelling and video. And, you know, you kind of want, he's kind of wondering why, why is there nothing, um, nothing available for video storytellers in the military like there is for photo storytellers? There's workshops and there's um, contests. There's all sorts of things for the photographers to really hone their skills. But what do we have for video? So he started formulating um, this plan to work with Johnny Bavera, who's the founder of these Visual Media One workshops, which um, the photo workshop and the video workshop fall under. Worked with Johnny Bavera to um, to make the video workshop a reality. And so five years ago, we had our first video workshop. And there's a core group of us that work pretty closely together on it every year. Like I said, there's Juan and Anna, Blake Stilwell, uh, myself, um, as well as Johnny Bavera and a few other people uh, that, like I said, we just, we get together every year and we um, kind of haphazardly sometimes get this together and pull it off. And it, it's tough, you know, it's, it's a nonprofit and all of us work full time. Um, but we are, we're passionate about storytelling. We're passionate about the people that come to the workshops and come because they want to be better and to tell stories better um, and to tell stories with feeling and emotion and, and passion. So um, yeah, it's, it's just a really, really cool experience. It's a great opportunity for, uh, you know, visual storytellers. And how, how long are the videos that uh, are the end result of the workshops? So the workshop functions kind of like a film festival. We have this four-day workshop, right? And it starts on a Thursday. 
Um, and that Thursday, uh, we have a lot of really amazing guest speakers come. We have, uh, you know, people like Jim Fabio, who shoots for the NFL, um, Bill Gentile. Um, we've had him in the past, and he's, you know, the godfather of backpack storytelling. Um, you know, we just have some really great speakers every year to really kind of motivate folks. And the next day on Friday, they get assigned their teams and um, they get to work closely with a mentor, somebody that's been in the career field for a while um, to kind of act in an ex- executive producer role to kind of help them through the team, through the, the process. And they have from, you know, the afternoon of that Friday till 8 a.m. on Sunday. So they have a, you know approximately 36 hours to find a story based on the theme provided find a story, shoot it, edit it, and turn it in. And the final product that they turn in is a three to five minute piece. So it can be, I mean, it can be a scripted piece. It can be a documentary style piece. It can even be a news story. But the goal is to tell a story impactfully uh, and well and to encompass the theme that's provided. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty awesome. We We spend some time... Um, we spent a lot of time, you know, the night before, because people can register up to the day of, like they can roll in that Thursday um, <laughs> and register. So Thursday night, uh, the core staff, we get together and we hash out the teams and they're usually teams of three. Um, and we really try to make sure that there is one, aside from the mentor, you know, one strong person on the team that has, you know, a decent amount of experience. And, you know, we try to divide up people based on strengths and weaknesses and pair them with a mentor that makes sense for them. So if we have somebody on the team that's a really strong editor, uh, maybe we'll give them a mentor that's a very strong shooter. And the mentor, they can't shoot or edit for them. But like I said, they're they're kind of there in this executive producer role to kind of help them when they get stuck um, or to mediate, you know, if there's issues or personality conflicts, because, you know, by the time... These guys and gals turn in turn in their products. They're tired. I mean, they're sleeping on the floor. <laughs> like a lot of them, you know, you don't sleep starting that that Friday afternoon. You're done. So they're exhausted. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of conflict. Um, but I think that's good. You know, it teaches you networking, and and you know, it's another thing that we try really hard to do is divide people up. We try to divide people um, in teams uh, so that they don't know each other. Um, different services different agencies, you know, the vet, you know, people that are veterans that have been out for a while and, and people that are still active duty. We try really hard to, you know, kind of, kind of get them away from, from their comfort zone. So it's, yeah, it's a pretty great experience. Nice. And is there a maximum number of slots that, uh, that you have for this? Yes, we have, um, we're capping it this year at 65. 65. Oh, so yep. for the listeners out there, Go and register now while you have an opportunity. That's right. You can go to shootoffvideo.net um, and find the registration button at the top of the screen. Great. And I'll make sure that I put uh, links for, for all of this in the show notes so that everybody could find the registration page and more information on you and as well as the organization. Awesome. Um, Thank you. So is there, is there any cost to the veterans for this event? Um, there is, uh, a lot of times they can get their unit to pay for it. Um, and a lot of units will, if, uh, you know, it's considered a training opportunity. Um, but it's one of the cheapest workshops you'll find out there. It's, um, an $85 registration fee. If you register, wow, that's yeah, awesome. If you reg- yeah. If you register late, which I, trying to find the late date i'm not sure what the late date is but the late date is 95 um which again is still really cheap and you can also come and just observe the um the workshop if you want if you want to come and watch the speakers um and watch the judging you can observe for 40 bucks and that's like a non-compete price so you can come watch these really amazing speakers um give their lectures uh for for 40 dollars Wow, that's incredible. I mean, just the lectures alone, it's hundreds of dollars in value, not including anything else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a great experience. And that's, you know, we're in Arlington, so we're kind of, you know, close, super close to the heart of DC. And, um, you know, it's, it's not too hard to get to. 
And so at the end of this, is there, are there prizes given away? There are. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the prizes are going to be this year. Um, we're still working out some of our sponsors. Um, we're sponsored by companies like Adobe. Nice. Yeah, they in the past have given away, um, you know, year subscriptions to the Adobe Creative Suite. We're also sponsored by Canon. Um, Canon doesn't typically give out prizes, but what they do, um, which is really incredible, is they bring really amazing gear for folks to check out, um, get their hands on. Sometimes they bring out cameras with them that aren't even released um, to the public yet. Mm. So you get some hands on some really amazing gear. Um, and the Canon guys, the Canon guys are incredible. Michael Cutler, he's um, he's our main liaison. Um, and he's just, bring, like I said, he brings the best gear for us. We, this year, like I said, I'm not, I'm still not hundred percent sure on all the sponsors that we have this year, but in the past we have been sponsored by people like GoPro and, oh, I'm trying to think of some of the others. There's a lot, sorry, <laughs> but there, we always have a lot of really great sponsors. You can actually read, um, about some of them. So it's shootoffvideo.net. Um, and you can read more about the workshop altogether. We have an about page. We have, um, links to... Um, our YouTube page where you can view um, some of the work from the previous years. Nice. Um, yeah, we also have a Facebook page. Um, if you search for DC Video Shoot Off, you can find us there as well. Great. And so are you still looking for more sponsors if somebody happens to be listening that uh, wants to sponsor this event? Absolutely. We're always looking for sponsors. We're a nonprofit. Um, you know, most of us, but all of us <laughs> that work the event aren't getting paid. Uh, we rely on sponsors for, you know, snacks and stuff to feed our participants to get some, you know, limited amount of hotel rooms in the area um, for mentors and for participants. We usually, you know, we'll we'll grab a few rooms for people to, you know, for for like five people to go share, you know, take shifts sleeping. Like we we can't afford to get a room for everybody but we'll have like a handful of rooms and, and sponsors help to, to pay for that. They also help to pay for um, things like uh, our, our Wi-Fi um, and to provide um, prizes and incentive um, for these participants. So yeah, we're always constantly looking for sponsors. And even if it doesn't even have to be video or photo related, even if we could just like get gift cards to raffle off or, or anything like that, you know, it's, it's really, really cool. But, you know, I think even if we didn't have any prizes, um, I'd venture to say that most people would come do it anyway, because it's such a fun experience and it's such a great networking opportunity. You know, I don't, I don't get prizes, you know, I work it, um, but I can't wait to go every year. It's just such a a great experience. So prizes or no prizes, um, you know, it's, uh, it's incredible to be there. And uh, what are the dates for, for this year's event? This year, um, the it goes from 30 April through 3 May. Um, and like okay. I said, that's a Thursday through a Sunday. It's a four-day workshop. And uh, yeah, that's the, those are the dates. Outstanding. I think we are ready to get into the final three. Are you ready, Maureen? Um, probably not, but I'll try. <laughs> okay, here we go. Question number one. Who would you like to hear on a future episode of Veteran Resource Podcast? Um, I think I would like to hear from Chris Etter. Uh, He is an Air Force veteran, um, and he does some crazy bendy things with his body, which um, people that work (laughs) out may call call yoga. But what's really (laughs) cool about Chris is he offers a workshop um, or a a yoga class once a month um, that's free for veterans. And it's like a mindful yoga therapy session and a uh, whole yoga. Um, and it's, uh, it's just really great. He, he volunteers a lot of his time. Um, and a lot of the things that he does, a lot of the effort he puts forth is, um, healing for veterans. So I'd really like to hear from him. Well, I have a goal of touching my toes by the end of the year. So <laughs> I, I think I'm definitely going to reach out to him. <laughs> Or up or downward dog, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, moving on to question two. What upcoming project has you fired up right now? Oh, man, you know, that's hard. There's some projects that I'm 
I'm looking at um, being in, involved in and there's stuff with work that's really incredible. Um, one of the things at, at work that I'm hoping to accomplish sometime this year is to um, get Airman Magazine um, in your hand. Um, and when I say that, I mean, you know, currently it's available on tablet devices like iPads, um, but we don't have it available yet on on phones, on iPhones or Android devices phones um so that's really huge and that will be a big step forward for us at airmen and i'd really like to do that um personally this one i'm still debating on but um you know i, I might do comic-con again this year and you know sell some of my my side work my freelance stuff um oh nice yeah nice. I, i'm still debating it um you know it was tough last year um, but it was a good experience for me networking and getting some of my personal work out there and so you know, that, that, that could potentially be exciting. Um, but I haven't haven't quite decided, (laughs) decided on that yet. So, well, I'll be sure to put some information in the show notes as well about your, your, uh, side project there at Design Stew, correct? Yes. Yeah. That's uh, my freelance endeavor. That's kind of where I, um, you know, I do creative things all day for other people. So Design Stew is kind of, um, the place where, um, a lot of my work I do for me, I do a lot of art print and I'll, I still take commissions occasionally, um, logos or portraits, stuff like that. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my side gig. Um, and all of your infinite spare time, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so much of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question number three, this is the brain stretcher. If you woke up tomorrow and you found out that somebody made an anonymous donation of $10 million to your organization, what would you do with it? Oh, ten million dollars to the DC shoot off, huh? Um, <laughs> I think I think if that happened, I would really love to maybe buy a facility for us to have the, this workshop, you know, yearly, a place that was dedicated for us where we didn't have to worry about having the space, uh, a place where we could have a secure place for our gear and, and for our students. Um, and yeah, a place that was dedicated to that. We really struggle every year. You know, we've been very, very fortunate um, because the Navy League building has really helped us out um, as much as they can every year. And we, I'm pretty sure we get the place for free right now. But we're always kind of on pins and needles the months leading up because we're not sure if we're going to get the dates we need or if they're going to be able to. And Last year, we had some issues where we didn't get it the whole time, um, and it was really hard. So, yeah, I'd love to find a dedicated facility for that. That would be incredible. That, that would be pretty cool. If there's any, if there's any yeah. listeners out there with an extra $10 million, <laughs> very interested in, in uh, the film work, the film industry, and helping out veterans, <laughs> this, this would be a good place to put it. Mm-hmm. And so, right. <laughs> you always dream, right? Absolutely. And push those stars around. Hey, there, there's people out there. There's people out there with the money. Yeah, there are. Yeah, there are. And uh, you're pretty good at pushing stars. So, um, I'd take a million. That would be cool. <laughs> Hell, I'll, I'll even take half of that. You know, not, not greedy at all. Not greedy at all. No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> I'll take ten dollars, really. Like I'll take whatever <laughs> you guys can say it. So. <laughs> and uh, is there a place on on the website where people can can donate? Um, I believe that folks can actually donate through the registration form, but I'm not a hundred percent on that. You could always, I mean, you could always, if you wanted to drop forty dollars, you could always donate as an observer and not go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. I you know. One thing I'd like to do at some point is, um, you know, we create fun t-shirts every year for the workshop and I may at some point um, grab a Teespring account and throw those up on on there so that folks can buy shirts with all the proceeds going back to um, the shoot off. So there's a lot of things that we need to do, but you know, it's tough. So <laughs> just need to reach out to your friendly neighborhood Drupaler. Yes. And, uh, yes. Get that added to the website. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, thank you so much for the interview today, Maureen. I, I'm sure that there's some listeners out there that are going to be interested in the DC shoot off and uh, they can go to the, the show notes page and find out exactly where to go for registration and all of the information about you and your organization. 
That would be great. Thanks for listening. Thank you, everybody, for listening to episode three of the Veteran Resource Podcast. So what did I tell you? Maureen's pretty amazing, isn't she? And the DC shoot-off video workshop is sounds just so cool, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. $85 for a multiple-day event, and you've got speakers that are going to be helping you with workshops, and you've got people like... Adobe and Canon coming in and letting you use some of their products that aren't even out available yet. So if you want to take advantage of the DC shoot off video workshop, make sure you check out the show notes, veteranpodcast.com slash 003 is where you will find all of the information about the website, information about Maureen, how you can get registered, and all of the great goodness dealing with the DC shoot off video workshop. Thanks again. And I will see you on episode four.